you have uh, at the very end, we have uh, James McCoy. Um, and James McCoy has been the director of the University of Iowa Press since 2011 and was previously the marketing director for the University of Iowa Press uh, in 2006. Um, and during that time, the press has won several awards, including the Penn American Award, the American Book Award, uh, and Shamba, and numerous Shamba Awards. They've also been finalists for the National Book Award. Their books are regularly reviewed in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, before coming to Iowa, he spent a decade with the University of Chicago Press. He holds a BA in English from Indiana University and was born and raised in Indianapolis. He has a son and a cat, but he also loves Greek. So, okay. Um, next up, we have uh, Hannah Skates Kettler. Uh, Hannah holds a BA from the University of Iowa in anthropology with minors in art history and classics. She also holds an MA from King's College London in digital humanities, where she specialized in virtual cultural heritage. Hannah is a digital humanities research and instruction librarian in the digital scholarship and publishing studio here at the University of Iowa. And in her role, she leads digital humanities projects from inception to preservation, managing the process of creation as well as providing research and developmental support. She's also very active in 3D creation and preservation and diverse representations in cultural heritage collections and digital humanities. Okay, next up we have Timothy Arnold. Uh, Timothy has a BA in History from Yale and a Master's of Science and Information Studies from the University of Texas at Austin and a Master's of Arts in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. He's the International Reference and Collections Librarian here at the University of Iowa Libraries and he manages the collections for Africa, the Middle East, uh, uh, South and Southeast Asia, um, International Studies, and for Classics. Uh, his areas of research are new media and emerging technologies in the Middle East, but particularly he's an expert on Twitter. Um, and he teaches and is an expert on information literacy, reference management, and social media collection development. Uh, and right now he is getting very well versed in the historiography of classics. Okay, finally, uh, our last panelist uh, is Cornelia Lang, uh, who got her PhD from the University of California at Los Angeles. She's an associate professor and now the departmental associate chair in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, her research is focused on radio and x-ray observations of galactic nuclear regions, most importantly, the center of her own Milky Way. She is working uh, to understand the energetic processes occurring in these regions, which include star formation and magne magnetic phenomena. But uh, she has 50 publications on these subjects and told me at the gym that she loves Greek. And so I told her in <laughs> because I was like, uh, you like Greek? You read Greek? And she was like, oh yeah, I know Greek. Um, and so that, that really is part of this discovery that you find out the background of people who love Latin, who love Greek, who just love ancient history. Uh, and you really want to know uh, how that informs who they are. So I'm going to sit down now and we'll ask a few questions and then we are going to throw it to you guys to ask questions, so prepare yourselves. Uh, but my co-moderator tonight um, is Jen Title. Uh, Professor Title has a PhD and is an Assistant Dean for Professional Development at the University of Iowa Graduate College. She holds a Doctorate in Language, Literacy, and Culture from the University of Iowa and a fiery torch, she has a fiery torch for interdisciplinary scholarship. She builds and maintains programs that empower graduate students to understand their strengths, build professional networks, and seize opportunities. She's also a mother to four children, a persistent doodler, and an aspiring breaker of chains. <laughs> she, reads, uh, she reads the comment section, though she knows she should not. I should also <laughs> say that she supports classics um, and many of the programs, particularly that the graduate students have participated in, uh, such as the three-minute uh, dissertation. So. Great. All right. So uh, I'll start off here, and then we can uh, move to a few other questions. Uh, although I touched on it a little bit, I just wanted to know what each of you guys' relationship is with classics, how you got started with it, and kind of how it informs what you do and who you are now. So, small question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're looking at me. Sure. Um, 
Well, I think my interest in classics started probably around fourth grade when I read a, a book uh, called Carry On Mr. Bowditch, which I'm thinking maybe Cornelia is familiar with. It's about uh, Nathaniel Bowditch, who was invented a new way to navigate the seas. Mm -hmm. But he was also uh, an autodidact. He was an indentured servitude, if I'm a uh, servant, if I'm remembering the story correctly. And the thing that really impressed me was not that he taught himself <laughs> navigation and algebra and calculus and all this stuff, but he taught himself Latin and Greek. Uh, and that stuck with me in the back of my mind. But somehow I got all through Catholic school and all through uh, my undergraduate experience uh, being a really poor student and never really investigating these uh, classics, even though I had this romantic notion of it in my head. And then I found myself in a bit of a crisis, so I came to classics kind of late, uh, in my early 30s. I was working at University of Chicago Press, uh, which is an intellectually daunting place. Uh, everyone seems to have a PhD, uh, even your assistant. Um, and. Uh, everyone seems to know eight different languages. Uh, uh, I had neither one of these qualifications, and I think I was suffering from a great deal of intellectual inferiority complex. Uh, but I also was uh, really felt myself stagnating intellectually. You know, there's a funny thing when you, happens when you get into a workplace, and there are two routes you can go. You can be very driven and, and uh, you know, work very hard to succeed, but for most of the population, you end up kind of stagnating and it's easy just to go to work every day and push the buttons and do the, the low hanging fruit and perform your task and not really think about it. And I really realized that was happening to me. Even though I was living and surrounded in, in this atmosphere that uh, really fostered intellectualism and, and the life of the mind, I wasn't taking full advantage. So I knew I had to do something, and that something came in the form of uh, pursuing what is known at, at Chicago as uh, the basic program. What is known at other places as a great books program. Uh, at University of Chicago and also at Columbia, and I think at St. John's and Annapolis, and a few <laughs> other places, no matter what you're studying as an undergraduate, you have to go through a four-year program of reading the basis of the Western canon as traditionally defined. Uh, and they offered this as a adult education, continuing education course too, through their uh, Graham School. So I began with that, and really the first two years are very, very heavy on Plato, Aristotle, the tragedies, uh, Lucretius, uh, some Shakespeare, and the Shakespeare and the, and the English stuff I had. I had been an English major. Uh, but the Greeks, other than you know some very cursory experiences in high school with you know Homer, uh, I really didn't have. Um, and so it was not only enlightening to get that background and to have be a part of a discussion, not just read it, but be a part of a discussion, but be a part of a discussion with a demographic that basically skewed very very much older, almost to the retirement age, of people who had a lot of life experience. And that brings a whole different perspective to something like uh, Aeschylus or, or Homer. Um, and through that, I eventually ended up, uh, I was approached one day after class by a woman that uh, I had a passing acquaintance with who was older, who was uh, from Greece, she and her husband uh, still owned a, a, a olive orchard in Greece, and she, uh, her name was Sonia, um, and she came to me and said, Jim, have you ever thought about studying ancient Greek? And I said, no, no, no. You're talking to someone who flunked out of French in college. Uh, <laughs> anything that I have to do every day is just not a good thing. Um, so she worked on me for a while and convinced me to come to a class that she was taking and uh, it was above my, my level but uh, soon after a, a beginning pro program was started for Greek uh, through the same adult education course and I, I began to study with a very small group with a lecturer from the Committee of Social Thought there 
And that led into a three-year uh, period of learning um, Attic Greek and eventually really being tutored one-on-one -on -one by this lecturer because uh, everyone else dropped out. And so they could no longer uh, run the course because no one was paying for it. Um, but uh, to the latter part of, uh, of Sarah's introduction, I mean, what has brought me is an enormous amount of discipline and confidence. Uh, but I was thinking today, today was my day to go through my uh, backlog of book reviews and, and TLS and NYRB. It's brought me a tremendous sense of grounding of Western civilization and context. And I have to have that in the job that I do. Uh, we are a humanities-based publisher. And uh, whether I'm publishing poetry today, or contemporary fiction, or an academic work on literary criticism, you'd be surprised at how that, that basic context informs everything. I read no fewer than five book reviews today that I was conversant with because I had this background. I read a, a book review about John Ruskin and I only read that because I'm, I'm looking at a book on John Ruskin. And right in the, in, in the middle of it is a little aside about Henry Liddell, uh, the lexo <laughs> lexo <laughs> lexicographer of Greek, which of course I knew who it was. Um, uh, so little things like that pop up constantly and, and it just gives you an intellectual grounding that is really necessary when you're uh, uh, kind of defining, helping to define, and, and wanting to help to define culture uh, as is a large part of what we do. So that's how it informs me today, among other things, but yeah. I've talked too long. Go ahead. No, great. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess it's a similar track, um, albeit a little shorter. Um, the interest in classics started um, when I was in elementary school, my, my mother was um, a curator for the Dallas Museum of Art for 17 years. Um, so I had the privilege of being um, exposed to a lot of different um, cultures, artifacts, stories um, through this, uh, through, through her work. Um, and so I, I found myself gravitating towards the more ancient. <laughs> it was not a modern art type person at all like that I just shut off um, but the the ancient history I was really I, I, I was really into um, and I think it was uh, there was one exhibition on uh, ancient Egypt that was happening and um, my parents hosted uh, a visiting scholar in, in um, uh, Egyptology and we had dinner at the house, and I was able to interact with this with this person, um, and it was a lot of fun, um, actually. And I could ask all of the harebrained questions that little kids ask, embarrass my parents sufficiently, um, and then I was able to then go to the exhibit after after the dinner as well. Um, and that was actually the first time I think that I saw I saw myself in 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 art um, before. Um, it was very much uh, very Western focused, or even even African art. I couldn't couldn't really see myself in so much, but the Egyptian. There's something about seeing the the Egyptian iconography that I could really relate to, um, and so that's I think where that uh, the initial flame started there. Um, fast forward, I guess, <laughs> um, and. Uh, I started college. I went straight into art history because I was very comfortable with that. Um, loved it. Found it very restrictive <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, they made me study modern art, and I hated them for it. So um, I decided to switch majors. Um, as, as Sarah mentioned, I, I, uh, I got my BA in anthropology, which I found to be the most flexible. Um, and because it's all about anthropology, right? Um, and so that was the basis, and then I was able to study then art history and classics uh, together. Um, and so I was able to get, you know, my ancient history kind of uh, fixed there, um, and then also situate that in much larger, um, deeper history even than, than classical history um, that just kind of fed my soul. 
Um, the other part of it is that um, I was very interested in, I guess I should say I had uh, troubles in school um, with <laughs> long form text, especially about classics and especially about um, archaeology, anthropological practices. I just, I didn't uh, quite get it. So I started drawing stuff out. Um, and, uh, and then that then <laughs> somehow extended to <laughs> 3D modeling, and so I was actually building these spaces that I was reading about so that I could understand them. Um, and, uh, and so I realized then that there was this, um, this learning difficulty for me that I figured, well, I'm not, probably not the only person, right, that has this kind of visual learning um, as, as their preference. And so um, that's kind of how I shifted from uh, my path of being an Egyptologist, which is still like something I would love to do, um, to something where it's like, no, I'm gonna provide a way for people to learn about these things that are not these, these uh, text-minded or, or have some kind of print disability. And so that's when I started thinking about how do you expand that, how do you expand classics and, 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 and ancient <clears throat> history um, to folks like that. Um, and so I started thinking about, um, literacy and <laughs> differentiated learning and libraries cropped up right it's it's a place where all that kind of stuff happens and so I made that shift there and that's kind of how I how I continue to work um, and I thought that uh, my classics and, and ancient history kind of focus would kind of fall by the wayside as I moved into this cold literacy thing but it hasn't at all actually um, and there does seem to be quite a bit of, of uh, need for um, uh, folks who have an understanding of these, these larger systems, social systems, um, and how that's, well, I mean, it helps with the classics degree. We see it play over, over and over and over again. Um, and so uh, they, they that kind of that kind of expertise is actually quite useful even within libraries because we're, we're structuring information um, and how that feeds into knowledge creation and art and um, so it's just there's kind of this nexus that's being defined within the libraries that I think the classics classicist um, background really helps with um, and then also because it's maybe non-traditional <laughs> in some in some sense, you get called on for really fun projects, um, and you don't have to just shelve books all the time. So, uh, which actually I never do. There's a lot of librarians who don't do that, but um, uh, uh, so you get you get called on to do really fun things. And so one of the things that's uh, more recent is the the focus on um, uh, historical reconstruction and its use in video games. So, I mean, how awesome is that, right? So not only do I get to like talk about classics all the time um, in some circles, but I also get to marry that with video games. I don't know, so it's like an extension that I never thought would, would happen, but it, but it did. And it's been, it's been really quite fun. Okay. Thanks. So um, I uh, also started uh, classics with classics uh, through a, a great books program. I did graduate uh, from Yale University, but I, uh, I actually transferred into Yale and I started uh, at a small public university, uh, the University of Southern Maine, and I did uh, an honors program there. Uh, so uh, essentially at age 19, I was sitting around, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, oak table with a bunch of other 19 year olds and we're all <laughs> talking about the Iliad and uh, the Odyssey and, uh, and the Bacchae and, um, and Agamemnon, which remains my favorite play to this day and, 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 and it, has, it has a number of uh, compelling characters, particularly Clytemnestra and Cassandra, who I will always remember. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so I, I, and we, we talked an, about a number of things in addition to these kinds of great books in, in, in that program, and, and, and one of them uh, that I think has kind of stayed with me and, and, has, and, and has informed my work uh, is rhetoric and logic. Mm -hmm. Incredibly important. 
uh, it, it provided an incredibly useful foundation for me. Uh, and I'm about to tie this back into Twitter, and, and you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but I'm going to do it. Uh, so, so what I do now, actually, uh, in addition to collecting books from various parts of the world, is I, uh, uh, I teach information literacy, and I teach a class called Being Responsible Online, or BRO for short. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in this class, uh, I teach students uh, how to be responsible online, which includes a number of different uh, things like net neutrality, teaching them about net neutrality, uh, et cetera, uh, evaluating online information. I teach them about how to identify things like fake news. Uh, I teach them about lateral reading, how to verify sources, et cetera. Um, but, but one thing that I've introduced uh, into this course is a section called Logical Fallacies in Social Media. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so, um, so essentially uh, I, I talk about post hoc ergo propter hoc. I talk about ad hominem. I bring in examples of these logical fallacies from their natural habitat, Twitter. Uh, and uh, I have students try to identify them. And then I have the students bring in their own examples of logical fallacies. Um, and, uh, and it's been absolutely wonderful. And I think the students, they really get it. And I, because to a certain extent, I think for those of us who were born in kind of the middle or the latter half of the 20th century, I think we're kind of used to our news being filtered to us through broadcast media, right? Um, so, our, so we're used to our news um, being presented to us after it has gone through a, a great uh, amount of, of rigor, right? Digestion. Di exactly. Um, you know, broadcast media has uh, systems of, of best practices for editors and fact checkers, etc. But in social media, we have none of that. And so in, in certain ways, I think our media and our information landscape resembles that of the ancient Greeks or the ancient Romans, maybe even more than that of the 20th century. And, and it requires a great amount of, uh, of rigor on the part of the, uh, of the information consumer. And that's something that um, Aristotle and Socrates and Plato would have a lot to say to us. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I found classics uh, when I was in high school. I grew up in northern North Dakota, and there weren't as many intellectual opportunities as I would have liked. Um, but there was a very unusual woman who would show up at our high school at the end of the day, and she would use a classroom that was no longer being used. The school district wouldn't let her do this during the re regular day. And we could take uh, Latin and Greek from her. Her name was Frances Mary McMullen, and she ran, ran a Latin correspondence school. She had stationery printed, and she had hundreds of students across the country that would do, basically it was like an online course before online courses were developed. So she was a character, and I was desperate to be different than everyone in my high school. So I went to this class every day after school religiously. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we did Latin, and she would call us by our Roman names. So she loved Cornelia, and she would call us, you know, she called us by our first two names. So I was Cornelia Chesley, and I had to rise when she called on me. It was very, very formal, and I loved every minute of it. And on Thursday and Friday, she said we had to do Greek, because you can't study Latin without also knowing Greek. So when I got to college, um, even though I was uh, definitely science-minded and heading into science, I took uh, classics my entire way through college. Uh, so I took Latin my first year, and I started Greek my sophomore year. I took Latin and Greek my sophomore year, and then I took Greek all the way through. I never had a, a minor or major or anything, but I just sort of did this on the side. And what was really great was that it completely informed the way that I they thought about my science career. So I study astronomy, I'm an astronomer, as Sarah pointed out, and for me there's this deep connection between the disciplines. If you think about you know, the ancient Greeks and especially the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers essentially with their fragments, they were so ahead of their time. And so when I discovered those fragments, and took ancient philosophy classes alongside you know, the search for life in the universe and thinking about the discovery of planets orbiting around other stars, which they predicted in those fragments. 
I mean, I just, you know, I felt like my <laughs> entire college career was complete. The problem was I didn't take a lot of social science, so I've got some catching up to do in that, in that area. But I, um, but I, I do really think for me, um, going back to the context, I feel like my studies and classics alongside science were just um, so helpful. And the, I felt like the studies and classics really provided me with a context I needed to get out of this very detailed work I was doing in physics and astronomy. And so I so appreciated all the courses I took. I had you know, amazing professors. We would sit at small oaken tables and, you know, two of my, these were two of the texts that we translated in my sophomore and junior years and you know, I still keep them as treasured items on my shelf. I look at my notes. It did, it did help also that, um, you know, when I was studying physics, I had no problem identifying all the Greek letters in equations. So I was always <laughs> sort of... Uh, the other thing I did was at, at, I was at Wellesley College for my first two years in college, and there was a long tradition there of classics, um, some amazing uh, faculty members that we got to be in their presence and read uh, texts with them. But by far the favorite thing the years I was there was the annual classics performance. So in traditional times, it would have been in an amphitheater outside, which they had. Um, but the year that I participated in the classics performance, we decided to try to build up a wider audience. So my friend Catherine was the director and I was the sort of assistant director and we did uh, Iphigenia at Aulis and we worked with a team of artists in the art department to make uh, foam replicas of ancient Greek masks. So we worked with this unbelievable artist, Carlos, that's how I remember his first name, and we painted masks. We did research on what they would have looked like. We all learned 500 to 1,000 lines of ancient Greek memorized. So I was King Agamemnon, and I have a picture. I told you I bring props, so I have a picture. These are my, uh, my, my female classmates who came to support me. It's hard to see, but there is my mask. I don't think I even have the picture in color. And here is the t-shirt we made for the play. It said, uh, Euripides, Iphigenia, Alice, Jewett Auditorium, Wellesley College, May 1st, 1993, admission free, open to the public. And on the back of the t-shirt it said, my dad went to Troy and all I got was this bloody t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a Haitian drumming ensemble that provided the music. We did backdrops of modern art images of war. And the chorus was sung in English, which, we, which would help widen the audience's understanding. And then the five or six of us characters spoke in ancient Greek. So like when I think about... Did that expand your audience? It did. We had, we had, it was like on record, it was the biggest performance. And there is a video, there's a VHS of this somewhere that I want to get my hands on. But, you know, it was those experiences for me um, that really shaped my whole undergraduate education. And I think... The think about the work that I do here at the University of Iowa and the way that I think about students and the way that I think about teaching, it all comes back to context. So I teach a lot of introductory astronomy courses and I'm always giving the stories of discovery, the stories of natural philosophers. Over the last three or four years, I've worked to develop a set of courses on campus called Big Ideas courses. So I've developed two and there are five other teams of faculty who have developed um, five other courses and these are courses that are taught at the general education level and they aim to bring disciplines together so the requirement is that you're, you teach with at least two three faculty members total that represent different disciplines and you have this dialogue in front of the students and with the students about how the different disciplines inform each other and so um, I, I can trace back my interest in doing that to you know, my sort of dual life as an undergraduate doing intense work in classics and then intense work in, in science. So. I'll, I'll jump in. So you, you answered some of the basic questions here, so thank you for that. Something that I noticed when all of you were talking was sort of an intellectual self-confidence. And I was wondering if, if you could speak to how that developed and how that perhaps developed through your studies in, in classics or if there's another sort of skill set or mindset that you feel like you developed specifically from your, your studies of classics. Could you speak to that? I can say something um, just because I have, you know, when I, when I actually open these pages and see, you know, I see my notes, I, I see what I wrote. Um, 
you know, for me being at a small college and having small classes where we sat basically at a table with other students and then a faculty member and working through the translation of each of these sentences. For me, I saw no difference between the translation work I did and the equations I was doing in physics, except for the fact that the translation required a higher level of art and articulation and word choice, but we were just rote trying to understand what the, what the basic translation was. So I do think that experience of you know, thinking about what you were reading, translating it, communicating it with the professor, hearing, again, the context of why, why and how that was written, the, the just practicing that over and over again through all those courses was something very complementary to what I was doing in my physics classes. Yeah, I would echo that to some degree, that uh, within me, as I said, I, was, I really felt acutely, and I, I cannot stress this enough, uh, and I don't want anyone to think that the university press is in bad hands, but I was a horrible student. <laughs> um, I mean, horrible. Uh, the fact that I got out of college in four years is still a mystery to me. Um, uh, I really didn't have much motivation or drive, and, and I, I did, as I grew up, which actually happens in, for me in my 20s, not in my teens, uh, I realized I had really squandered an opportunity. I had been given uh, a real advantage in life um, and had squandered it. And, and that was a deep motivation. Uh, but as I said, I had developed this kind of inferiority complex and this stagnation. But more than anything, I had become afraid to think. I mean, that might sound silly, but I had really become afraid to engage myself because of pride the concept of failure. I mean, um, I was not so smart that I, I never learned how to study, which is why I barely skated through. And I was not so smart, like I was a genius, that I was getting straight A's barely studying. I was so smart that I was getting like C's and D's. Um, so I needed to learn how to study. But through that, uh, the twin engines of learning a language, an ancient language of having to learn by rote and then having to learn how to translate mm -hmm. develops a neuroplasticity that was very clear to me when I, I engaged in, in, my, in my 30s. Mm -hmm. Maybe not when I was in my teens if that had been the, the road I had taken, but it was very distinct to me in my early 30s that my mind was changing. You know, much like they talk about mindfulness changing people's uh, neural pathways. I felt that through classics. Uh, I could do the stuff I wrote. I have a really good memory, and I just need to. I needed to develop that. But I work with translators uh, in my job, and I have an extraordinarily developed uh, respect for what a translator does, uh, because what is required in that is is this deep well of knowledge married with creativity um, that. I'm in awe of, and um, so, but in terms of intellectual confidence, that has come to me late in life. Uh, I've always been a really, quote unquote, well-read person, as you might expect from my profession. Uh, but it seemed like secondhand to me. That's just what I did. I read everything. Um, that was like a hobby. Um, but I did learn that I could engage with ideas and accomplish something that I set out to do that I didn't really think I could do. As I said, I had always failed at trying to learn a language. Uh, and so as, as kind of intellectual penance, I decided to pick the hardest thing I could find <laughs> uh, other than like Sanskrit and learn it. And uh, that did bring a lot of confidence to me, I think. <laughs> That's funny. You should say you weren't very good at language. I was actually really horrible at languages, too. Yeah. Um, that was one of the, fir <laughs> the first stumbling blocks, I guess, of my path to Egyptology was the fact that I had to learn like a bajillion languages just to, <laughs> just to get to the professional <laughs> level. Um, and uh, taking, I, there's, there's a lot to be said about taking, you know, different languages um, and, and um, growing through that. And I think that does provide a level of understanding, at least on the cultural level, that um, I think just studying cultural um, I was going to say cultural anthropology. Um, <laughs> cultural studies uh, doesn't necessarily provide. Um,
of uh, context there that I think we're missing unless we do take language. Um, but yeah, in terms of like confidence, uh, intellectual confidence, um, that's something I th think that we kind of work on iteratively. Um, I, at least I do. There's there's a point at which you peak and you're like, yeah, I got this. And then you meet someone else and you're like, ooh, I do not have this at all. <laughs> you know? um, but being able to deal with those ups and downs, I think, is, uh, I think you just kind of figure the mechanism is for that. Um, I thought I knew everything about uh, <laughs> ancient history from a museum. Um, and come to find out that I did not because they had to distill that into a placard that only allowed a paragraph. So there's not there's not a lot you can necessarily take out of that. Um, and so yeah, once I got to uh, college, it was kind of eye-opening. I was also not a very good uh, studier. Um, but uh, I think some of the confidence in, in, in continuing to pursue that actually came from a lot of the, the folks that I did meet um, and a lot of the professors that were supporting me through that. There's a, there's a couple in here, actually, <laughs> who were, who were uh, really helpful as I was trying to uh, get, get through college. Um, and so, I mean, that kind of confidence, though it's, you know, self-propelling and motivating, there's also, uh, you know, you have friends <laughs> that, can, that can help you with that. At least I found that there's... Um, there are times when I, you know, I lean on them, right? Uh, and so I think that's, the, you know, that flexibility to ask, ask for help, ask for guidance, uh, just have someone be like, "Am I doing this right?" No, you're great. It's like that's what I needed, um, and that's that's the level of self awareness kind of helps um, develop that as well. I think. So I mean, the word guidance, I think, for me, is kind of a funny word um, because I feel like. As I get older, I become in some ways less and less confident uh, about about most things. Um, but I think Socrates would like be very happy with that <laughs> because I think what I learned <laughs> because what I think I learned from these classical texts uh, and, and probably the most valuable lesson was to doubt, was to question absolutely everything, um, and uh, and and it's funny because like like I just said, you know. I'm maybe in some ways not as confident, but in some ways I actually think I am more confident because I'm able to, 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 to look at you know uh, a comment someone makes in the comment section and say, okay, well, yeah, I, I don't have to accept that, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> very healthy. And I can look at it and say, oh yes, that's a straw man, or oh yes, that's a yeah, that's a false dichotomy. Yeah. I wanted to ask one question before, sure. then we'll move to the crowd for the last like 15 minutes or so. But um, Hannah said something earlier about seeing herself in, in Egyptology, right? And I just wondered like, whether you to see yourself in a different form at a different time period and whether that had something to do with your love of classics. Like what happens when you or do not see yourself in a discipline, whatever your identity or ethnicity or gender, like how does that shape whether you connected to classics or not? Yeah, that's going back to the kind of intellectual intimidation thing. For me, that's a real thorny, naughty issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never label myself as anything other than a dilettante and perhaps a flaneur. Uh, I, I don't think um, I belong in anything, which is probably why I'm a pretty decent publisher. It, it demands that I have to be a jack of all trades, uh, both in, in understanding content, but also in other, a lot of other ways. Um, and because of that uh, understanding of myself, I think it's actually allowed me to excel at that. Um, I do see a lot of publishers who are very, uh, who do identify in a very close way with a discipline or, or something else, and it's often to their detriment. Um, they get too narrow-minded and, and focused and uh, uh, have, in my mind at least, in my interpretation, have trouble seeing larger issues. Uh, so that would be my answer. But. It's really helpful when you work 
at a university to be um, you know so open to other disciplines it just it makes being on campus so rewarding you know I'm always so interested in what my colleagues are doing in different departments I want to know about courses and opportunities for students when they come and talk to me you know, I do a lot of advising and I love to help especially like the physics and astronomy students find courses outside of our department they spend so much time in our department and so I think you know my uh, background in being able to, you know, sort of be both in science and have one foot in the humanities or the classics or whatever you call it has just, I think, really helped me be a better member of a university community. And I really, I really appreciate that. I think about it almost on a daily basis. Something will come up in my work life where I need to you know, find out what's going on in a different department and it allows me to quickly parse course titles and try to put in you know, in my head in different areas. And I, again, I think it's that broad context that I got studying classics. Uh, I think, let me be a little bit more specific about how personal, and this might be too personal, but let me just give you an example. I come from a lower middle class background. When I started reading about blue collar worker, <laughs> artisans and tradesmen, which is what I write about, mm -hmm. I saw myself. I saw people who didn't have a lot of money, mm -hmm. who had like maybe strong family ties, but I come from the Appalachian Mountains. I'm a Southerner in classics, which doesn't happen all that much, right? <laughs> Myself, particularly with the kind of hoi polloi artisans and tradesmen that I went on to study. And so that's what I kind of grasped onto. So when you read Sappho, when you read Women, did you feel like you yourself as a woman as well like when that you saw that that there were women in the ancient world that you could connect to no no I was right I just wanted to be one of the the guys I wanted to be <laughs> one of the guys writing a fragment about the, the, the chance to find worlds other than our own yeah. so I didn't have that personal connection but I had a, I had a connection to the material I think right. because I was learning I was reading a of astronomy and I was really fascinated with this idea that you know the early philosophers were also just um, again they were um, they were multidisciplinarians you know naturally and I, I really loved that so that's how I saw myself as I wanted to be that kind of traditional um, scholar or just you know generalist somebody who knew a lot about uh, a lot about many things you know I mean in general, uh, I do connect with the idea of tragedy. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, and I'm I'm an optimist. I've, you know, and we all have to deal with tragedy in our life on a pretty severe level. Um, that's what life is, uh, if you choose to look at it that way. And and I think that universi universality of both in the very nuanced ways that the Greeks dealt with it really appealed to me as I said coming to it later and, and being in at that table uh, that we've all been at but being with it with people who had a lifetime of experience mm -hmm. of losing children children's doctors who had you know gone through a lifetime of losing patients lawyers who had seen the worst come out of family law and everything else was really eye-opening and and uh, you know the you know, today, I mean, the the PTSD that comes out of uh, Achilles. I mean, all those things do greatly inform me. And, and as with any kind of group therapy, I mean, it's it's letting you know it's all right. You know, it, it's that's the way the human condition has always been. And so for that, I mean, that's what I relate to. But otherwise. Uh, I don't know if I have so much, uh, this isn't necessarily so much of a personal anecdote, but I think that one thing that we should think about here is that um, classics is, is kind of, it's called classics for a reason, because these, right, something is classic if it's something that can resonate with multiple different kinds of people at, at multiple different times. So, we, uh, you know, if we talk about a classical text, uh, like a classic American text, it, it's something that's timeless in a way. Uh, and so uh, I'm not of Middle Eastern background, but you know, I, I know from, from studying the Middle East for a number of years that for hundreds of years, um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, 
the Islamic Empire saw itself as the, uh, um, the inheritor of the classical world. I mean, I think that we tend to, uh, to think in the United States and in Europe that we are kind of, you know, sort of the natural <laughs> inheritors of, of, of classical texts, but um, for a very long time, for four or 500 years, that wasn't the case. Um, I, I guess I could <laughs> expound a little bit if you want. Um, I think uh, what I really, <laughs> actually, you know what? It probably stems all the way to like dressing up for Halloween. I know, okay, I'll get there. Um, uh, so my mom and I are also, we're, we're kind of nerds. Um, and for Halloween, I would, uh, my mom and I would, would figure out what our costumes were. Uh, she wouldn't dress up. I say our because I made my little brother do exactly what I wanted him to. Um, and so we were always paired. And so whatever, you know, we dressed up as Halloween, we were always re related in, in some way. Um, and uh, so we, uh, every year we would dress up um, and we did like, uh, there was one year I was Queen Elizabeth I. Really awesome costume. Uh, there was another, I mean, I was a pirate too, it was fine. Um, but <laughs> there was also um, Martha and George Washington, which went over interestingly. Um, <laughs> because I wasn't immediately recognized as being Martha Washington. Um, but when I dressed up as Nefertiti, and when my brother dressed up as Ramses, people got it. And so it, and we were really young at this point. And so I think that initial first impression of being like, ah, now people know. This must be where people who look like me reside, is in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so I was really interested in where those people came from and what they were doing because mm -hmm. they're in museums too, so they must mm -hmm. be important. Mm -hmm. um, in ways that you know, medieval uh, portraiture kind of is, isn't necessarily um, as, as uh, rounded out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it was something as simple as that, as being recognized um, when you were dressing up in, in these really nerdy costumes. Um, uh, that kind of, I think, it made that initial reaction. And I think I was wearing the galabea that that um, uh, Egyptologist gave to me from that dinner. So it was like, yes. <laughs> um, so I think, I think that might have been a little bit of, of that. Um, growing up in that museum setting, it was it was quite interesting to see what types of people came. Um, I was, I would say, rather observant uh, child, um, and so I would see the types of people and patrons that would come and donors that would come um, to the museum and what kind of spaces they would would inhibit and build, um, and the kinds of social structures that were part of that. Hmm. Um, and so there was. And in, there was a reflection, a constant reflection of being the only black kid in this area, and what that meant in terms of art, and in terms of civilization, and um, what was important. And so I think that's why I had this initial, like, really personal connection, is because of those circles I was inhabiting. Um, but I think it, it might be also very, well, it is individual, right? It's not, it's not everyone's experience. So that's what I meant by that. Great. We don't have a ton of time. We have about 10 more minutes before we go. But I did want to throw it out to the crowd just in case you guys have questions. Um, and you can direct it towards the entirety of the panel or towards individuals if you really want to. Yeah, Dana. So you guys are speaking before the um, new, middle, and old uh, students from classics um, or people who are just enthusiastic about the studies in general, which is wonderful, um, and it's nice to hear that several of you didn't start out or um, intend to do classics, but you kind of found your way there in your lifelong studies. Um, in a day and age where the humanities are under attack and people are constantly having to justify the study of classics specifically, um, I'm just wondering if any of you had to justify your hobby or your coursework or your interest to loved ones or relatives of loved ones or your friends and um, maybe advice to young students in the audience who are dealing with that now with your own parents. How did you deal with it if you had to experience with it? Is there advice you need to them? Well, I started as an English major. You know, 
perhaps one of the reasons I was not a good student was I, I you know, I was the original latchkey kid from the 70s and 80s and all that implied, which was not a lot of parenting. Um, and I remember the only, you know, life advice I got educationally was just go and get a degree. We don't care what it's in. Uh, just get the degree. Um, and uh, so I didn't have to fight that battle with my parents that, oh, you need to go and find a vocation and all that other stuff. Uh, but I'm a parent now and uh, a 13 year old who is developing his own interest and taste and personality constantly, who is intellectually very bright, um, who tells me this morning that he's getting three B's uh, at the junior high level. And I'm thinking, silently, I'm thinking, Jesus, I was a horrible student. Even I made straight A's in junior high. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on, kid. Um, I believe uh, part of this is kind of a metaphysical Greek answer. Uh, I believe in the life of the mind. And, and I believe that we can't know that by following what we want, what we love, and what we want to know, how that can possibly prepare us for our future. Um, I could never dream, A, I didn't know it was a job. Uh, but you know, when I was 17 or 18, I could never dream that I would have been pre a press director, nor could I have dreamed it when I was working for University Press when I was 30. It wasn't something that was going to be available in my career path. And my career really accelerated when you know, uh, I began to question and doubt everything. I, I no longer became satisfied with, oh, we, we do it this way because we've always done it this way. That's a, such a lazy way to think about life. And um, it, it's also a way to ruffle a lot of feathers uh, to a bad end. Um, but um, my point is, pursue what you love. You're not living this life for other people. It, you know, I, I do believe that your quality, your your intellect, whatever in, in the words of shape so will out. It will it will surface to the top of what you you will find a passion, whether it is to become a classics professor or some other pursuit that if you really want it, will marry what you've learned uh, with whatever profession you pursue, and it will be a benefit to you. So take this time, whatever has led you here right now to pursue it and don't worry so much about what other people think there's there's quite a just a just to add to that because i advise a lot of students and um i gave the commencement address last year at the university of iowa the big the big commencement is pretty overwhelming i was so glad i had everything written out like an ancient you know the speaker might in, in the structure but i had done quite a bit of research in preparing for for the address, and one of the things I looked at is what employers of recent college graduates in this day and age, when um, employees now going forward are probably going to change their careers. So all the students in the audience who are who are graduating, I was telling them, you you are probably going to be of a generation that changes your career seven to eight times. That's not the generation that I've been no. in, and so the skills that are required as an under, in undergraduate studies, and I'm sure there are logical connections with graduate studies. And we do this in, in you know, student studies theoretical physics. I spend a lot of time talking to their parents about what they can hope to do. And what I say is, it's the habits of mind, it's the discipline, it's the critical thinking, and all of these things we're practicing in our courses. And if you, if you love what you study and you, you make, you know, you're very successful at it, you really can do you really can do everything, it's very, anything. It's very hard to convince people of that, but you see it over and over again, people who become editors of newspapers. They don't necessarily have degrees in journalism. You know, they may acquire the skills of the field of journalism at some point, but what they are, they're very good writers, they're very broad thinkers, um, they really have dug into particular things that, um, that they enjoy studying about. So that, that's a message we try to convey to parents is it, that, it's, you know. It's, you can't replace passion. I mean, 
uh, not just for one thing, but it bleeds over into everything. And discipline is so important. I've strived for discipline all my life. Uh, and I will never achieve the ideal that I want to achieve on that end. Uh, but I, particularly classics, I think, brings that out. But any kind of rigorous, it is a train of, a mo of your mind that will pay off. And so many people, uh, if they don't do that, they struggle when they get into whatever workforce it is. And STEM employers more and more mm -hmm. actually don't want students or don't end up hiring after they interview hundreds of students or hundreds of graduates. The ones they end up hiring often have the kind of what you know an employer might call soft skills or you know uh, being able to think through something logically to be able to work with a team you know to go back to that table where you're sitting with the text and translating those are actually the kinds of things that can make very very successful employees and so more and more you know even STEM employers are saying they actually really hope their students have taken a wide variety of courses in their undergraduate training so so one of my favorite classical texts is actually Nicomachean Ethics because it teaches us this right I mean, it's also the best parenting guide I know. <laughs> it really is. It, you know, it is about uh, there's a right way and there's a wrong way, and, and there's habituation and all those things um, that you can't say enough about. Um, but, yeah, live your, live your dream if, if that's what you want to do. I feel comfortable with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I don't, I, you know, from my perspective, we need more people who understand how to teach things like rhetoric and logic to students. We absolutely need more, uh, more uh, people who can, who can do that. Um, and I, I feel like uh, the reasons are probably abundantly apparent to all of you. <laughs> um, Say no more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, some of my students really, really struggle when they try to apply things like logical reasoning to their day-to-day, -day, in their day-to-day -day information seeking behavior. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the I, I, I see that with employees, really intelligent people, but yep. uh, logically they're lacking. And, and it, it shows up in organization, mm -hmm. and it shows up in information seeking and that kind of stuff, uh, which we do a lot of. Um, and it's at a deficit right now. Um, so I would agree with that. Great. Well, um, Jen, did you have anything else that you wanted to ask? Can I throw a quick question? Please. I think some of yeah. you have already answered it, but favorite <coughs> text or author, and then I had to say least favorite, maybe the one that makes you pull, pull your hair out, and I couldn't be yeah. the same as your favorite. But. Okay. So favorite and least favorite. All right. Favorite, Agamemnon, as I said. Least favorite is the Odyssey. <laughs> and that's because it is so overdone. You know, this narrative of one man against the world, like, please. <laughs> I have, well, my favorite is Prometheus Bound, from, just because I translated the whole thing, and I'm proud of myself for doing it. <laughs> Least favorite, I struggled actually a lot with the Aeneid when I first translated that, and I never quite got the never quite got it that he was actually telling a story, that the things weren't happening in real time, and I'll never forget getting my first graded work back in college where my classics professor said, you know, I think there's some really big gaps in your understanding. <laughs> so I've always felt a little worried about that book. I, well, <laughs> um, actually, uh, going forth by day. So it's like the Book of, book of the Dead. Um, ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. <laughs> um, least favorite, uh, I guess. I guess it would be the Odyssey, just because I had to read it, and I have. I don't like people telling me what I should like, <laughs> um, <laughs> and that was one of those. Like it is the you know the text you should read. It's amazing, and I was bored through the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll stick with Nicomachean Ethics just as a practical guide. Boy, I remember really not enjoying some of Plato's dialogues, uh, particularly the Mino. Um, uh, as I give a, you know, a big thumbs up to, to logical thinking, I, somehow that was lost on me. Um, um, so I'll, I'll go with that. 
you know, the Odyssey is interesting. I'm sure you guys know the background on that, but until about 50 years ago, it was not a primary text that one had to read. It was actually kind of a lesser text mm -hmm. uh, because of these reasons. Yeah. Um, and, and since I think it's been elevated to, to the level of the, the Iliad, um, but my understanding is in, until the 20th century, it was not looked upon as a, a great work. So. Yeah. Well, great, wonderful. Well, I wanted to thank our panelists for coming and talking to us a little bit about classics and thank my co-moderators and title. Um, this has been really wonderful. So I would encourage you before I you know, send you forth, uh, I'm surprised no one said the Bible as their favorite and least favorite. <laughs> they usually even have that same space for me. It's like one of my favorites and one of my least favorites at the same time. And that's because, as you guys point out, canonical texts can be, um, you know, something that, that, you, that you are forced to read. And so maybe we don't always respond to it. But I would say, you know, keep in touch. Many of you are, are here because you love classics. Some of you are here because you love extra credit. Um, <laughs> that's also okay. All of these things are okay. So keep in touch and uh, make sure to reach out to myself or some of our panelists um, if you have any more questions. So thank you guys very much. Yeah.